Good morning. Morning. Hey, Justin, are you going to be with us the whole time or are you going to drop out and join again? Yeah, I'm going to drop out in half an hour and join again. Okay. And will you be there just at the last half hour from 10 to 10.30? Yeah, it's a one hour coordinating. For... It was all supposed to be, it's all complicated because it was supposed to be a cube kind of course. It's all really weird that we should all be a cube. We should all be in Amsterdam. <laughs> we have to pretend to be in Amsterdam. That's true. I should find some Amsterdam. Somebody's got to find an Amsterdam background. And put that in. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. um, yeah, I was uh, struggling. I realized last Friday, like, wow, we still have this meeting because it kind of snuck up on me. Um, so I scrambled to make sure we still have a structure of an agenda uh, to get things going. So um, glad Joe is. Yeah. Steve, I don't know if, if you changed your microphone or what, but it sounds like you're- oh. No, it helps to actually have it in front of my face. Is that better? <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> Thank you. Somebody noticed it yesterday when it was like, or the last week was behind my head. Like, That's really cool, but it might help the other way. Um, <laughs> <laughs> he's just not used to this kind of stuff, so. All right, um, so here's our structure for today. Uh, we've got, let me put the HackMD in our chat here. And uh, it is a loose schedule. Um, I shuffled it last minute a little bit because of uh, Justin wasn't gonna be available uh, till later. And uh, I wanted to try to just cover a couple of things. I've also asked uh, William from uh, one of the supply chain efforts to come and kind of give us an update of what they're doing. Uh, there was just a question of that on the Slack channel that, you know, we're, are we expanding our scope? And no, we're not. In fact, it's a matter of uh, trying to define the scope uh, to kind of componentize things. So that's what uh, the supply chain efforts are. But I don't think it's going to be a half an hour, but, you know, we'll see for timing. Um, other than that, if anybody's got other agenda items, please put it in there. Um, if you want to put, in fact, here, I'll put another one. Uh, other fill in items. If people want to put something here, add your topic. Underscore. Uh, then we can you know, fill in for other things. So uh, yes, I, it would be nice if we were in Amsterdam, although I don't know if the weather would be any nicer there. Um, so hopefully this summer, which I, I yeah, it's, I won't get into that rant of conversations. Um, all right, with that, uh, why don't we uh, get started? Um, oh, I see. Somehow I missed the, there it is, it's reformatted now for the distribution, getting distributions distribution spec to a 1L. All right, so let's, anybody have any other items they want to talk before I kick off? I don't really have a raise hand. What's the raise hand equivalent on Zoom? Vincent? Is there like a, people just drop in chat. Okay. I, I don't have know. no idea. <laughs> okay. Um, there's, if you click on the participants list, there's actually a raise hand option. Oh, okay, cool. And how would I, I don't see know what it? it does. Can you raise your hand? What does that look like? I'm actively raising my hand. Oh, it just shows a blue hand, which is four or five people. So I don't, okay. You know, it, I don't... it doesn't look like a notification. It's literally just a blue hand on the participant list. You see that? Oh, I see. Yeah, now I see it. Okay, so I'll just keep the participants list open. Yeah, put it cool. off to the Everybody's, side. Is everybody just saying hi? Yeah, I guess so. <laughs> All right, cool. All right, um, I'll try the screen sharing here uh, just to try to do a, a keep things going here. So the first one was uh, the latest on artifacts. Um, so where we're at is, you know, we've, uh, just as a quick update on what artifacts are, you know, so let me see, I think I've got it up here. Uh, the idea is to take the mechanism by which we store things in a distribution registry 
And the fact that there's these layers, which are blobs, and there's a manifest that describes a collection of the blobs, the idea that these things can be downloaded concurrently, um, and the fact that all of our major clouds and major vendors have created uh, an implementation of the distribution spec that runs in pretty much any modern production environment um, with VNets and security and all kinds of other capabilities that are required to be in that production environment, it'd be nice to be able to leverage that so that when new artifact types, whether it be Helm or Singularity were the two that impacted us in ACR, um, that we didn't have to create a bunch of one-offs for them. Uh, as an interesting side story to this, uh, in Azure, we have this ACR tasks feature, which is where we do cloud builds in the, in the cloud. And the, we've been keeping logs in the storage for the registry as well. Uh, recently, we've had to support customer managed keys so that they get double encrypted by the individual customer. Uh, and we had a struggle, like, what do we do? Because that cust we hadn't done that work with the, the streaming of logs for this thing. So we were able to um, completely change that interaction model. And we basically just going to store it in the registry. And because we're now storing those logs just as another artifact type, then it could benefit from the new CMK feature with VNets and, you know, I, I try not get into a, a, an advertisement of, of ACR, but I'm just saying the point is, is that we all have these hardened capabilities we're putting in registries and by storing things as just an artifact in the registry with a different media type to differentiate them, then all the other features we have in the registry, you know, get benefit, including the auto purge, the deleting, the stuff that we've been talking about recently. Um, so that's an example of something that's not just what I'm calling a well-known type, like such as these, but things that might be cloud specific that we then don't have to create all these additional ways to handle um, the standard capabilities we need on storage uh, in various clouds. Uh, so the, the conversation that we had last year on how to uh, understand what the different artifact types in the registry are, are using the config media type, uh, not the manifest media type, but the actual config media type. Uh, and that uh, was the, the least impactful way that we were able to leverage the schema of the manifest that exists uh, and give us the differentiation. And the, the best example I have is we all, you know, as we look at our file systems on disk, they have extensions. Um, and by having the extension on it, we know that if we double click it, what app will run. Virus scanners know what, how to process those files. And that's effectively what gets done here. So we can differentiate uh, the, different media, the different types of things that are stored in a registry. Um, anyway, so with that, um, there's some content in here. And what I'm looking at is I'm actually viewing here the la last PR in just view format to get a sense of it. Um, there's uh, how to define a unique media type. And one of the latest conversations we've been having is uh, uh, how do we define, you know, how do we create a clearinghouse for these media types? Uh, is it up to the artifacts or TOB uh, maintainers you know, to approve these as a first come first serve basis? And then it was kind of reminded that these media types were already set up uh, in IANA. Uh, Ayana, Ayana, Anna, whatever. Uh, and there's uh, a clearinghouse that's already made for those. Uh, there's a well-known format for them. They've got a, a really good uh, structure for the root trees. Uh, so that's the work I've been doing in the latest round of updates is to account for Ayana registration um, and the various forms. So if you notice here in this latest, uh, instead of just saying application slash, I'm referring to their registration tree. Uh, and then an org, a company, an entity uh, would be the name, uh, the next name. And then there's object type, sub object type, and you can go as many sub object types as you want. Um, config, and then a version and an optional config format. This was some of the other feedback that we had. Um, so uh, the IANA registration, we've been going back and forth on that. For those of you that kind of watch some of this, uh, this uh, the, the fun of formatting email has been an interesting challenge. So in the last round, I shifted to uh, just putting it as a markdown document for to get feedback here. Um, I believe, 
Uh, oh, I know if I look at the PR, you'll see the actual commentary. Um, and so far, they I just posted this the other day. Um, so I just kind of put my own notes, which was their feedback. These quotes were the feedback from Ayana um, and how to, to do this. Um, so I'll just, I'll finish up the sign of thing that I'll pause. So the uh, IANA registration I'm doing here is just for the, uh, where does it actually even say this? Let me just go back to the, the cleaner formatting. Um, for the image manifest, this is not a specific media type, but this is the manifest format itself um, that we use at the, well, the schema of the manifest as opposed to the config object. Uh, and I just picked the, simplest one, if you will, to kind of see what this registration process is like to go back and forth. Um, if you've been watching some of the emails, I've been letting them know that we anticipate you know, a bunch of things coming in. Um, I don't know, I was trying to do some guessing of numbers, somewhere between 50 and 200 over the next year or two um, for people that do media types, uh, the, the artifact types, and then their layers, which uh, it could be another registration as well if they choose. So it's been a back and forth. Um, of course, we've had other stuff happening in the world that make this a little more slow. Um, I was suggesting maybe just a conference call or something at one point just to, to talk it through. But once we get this round through, so this one seems to be the most concrete of uh, the feedback they've given. And by all means, if others have feedback, please provide it to help me with this because this definitely gets into a level of details that I hadn't really considered before. Um, but assuming this one gets approved, then we'll actually start doing like whether it be index or the image, the actual uh, con uh, image config object. Um, and then we can you know, let the Helm team go in their uh, submission process and so forth. So with that, I'm gonna pause for a moment. You think into the hundreds of MIME types? Well, the, if you think about it, and it might be less with the latest thought process that I kind of realized, if you, how many people will create artifacts, you know, maybe 10 to 20 well-known, well-known that need to be registered. Because like the one that we're doing for ACR task, for instance, doesn't make sense to run another uh, cloud. So it perfectly makes sense that it doesn't make sense to register as a well-known type. Uh, just the way we leverage that. So I imagine a lot of clouds and even customers might have their own. But I would think, I don't know, 20 or so. And then the original thought process is people would be creating their own layers uh, because they need uh, to differentiate one layer from another. Uh, but again, some of the feedback we had in the commentary was why don't we just leverage, you know, well-known standard not needed to be version things like application text. So for instance, for task logs, it's just a text file, it's a log. There's no versioning even to it. So for the layer, we decided to just use application slash text. Uh, so it might not go that high. Um, mm -hmm. uh, it, it really depends on how many people have different layer types that they feel they need to register as well. One, hey, uh, one quick logistical thing. Do you mind, do you, are you sharing your whole screen or just a window? I was sharing just my screen. May, either, then maybe just zoom in the font a little bit. Somebody oh, is the, okay. Yeah, is the registration? Wide enough. Resolution. Up to you. Yeah. How's that? Perhaps better. Okay. I could just change the res. Would it help to have change the resolution? I don't know. Just it, like that's that seems bigger on on mine, but somebody else on this channel says that. Let me. Um, have a smaller screen. Where is the other window that I can post the? I was trying to look for the chat window. Oh, there it is. It gets moved up here when you share. Or where's the chat window? That's interesting. All right, logistical challenges aside. Okay, I was going to try to paste this URL in for the, for others. Um, but okay. Uh, so, I, you know, we'll see in the numbers. Um, I don't think it's thousands. I don't think it's two. So uh, it was more of for them to think about, all right, can you help us with the feedback? Because if you look at the end of this, 
Um, so in this section, there's this optional defining artifact publisher manifests. And the idea here is for um, things like Helm, things like Singularity, things like OPA that uh, want to be equally shared across all clouds, uh, we want to be able to publish these well-known types so that we as registry operators can create a view similar to this. Like what's the icon that we'd wanna show? What is the string in a localized format that we'd wanna show? Um, and then for computer processing, what makes it actually unique? Uh, so that's what um, in a uh, schema that somebody would put this information in and the idea is to be committed to this artifacts repo and then we as registry operators can occasionally pull from this uh, and have these well-known types published. Um, it is a beginning of it. Uh, here's, I guess here's an example of something that I had made for an unknown um, as just an example of what one of these well-knowns would uh, look like. Uh, but the latest things that I've been working on is this media type would get registered with IANA um, and as I get the feedback on how we do this process, which is add IANA registration requirements here, uh, that others can follow the same. So there is other feedback in uh, the repo that I, in the PR feedback that I need to address, but that's the latest round of stuff I'd focused on. So, and Joey, I saw your feedback. I haven't had a chance to address it yet. No worries. I do have a question, but it's possibly slightly off topic. Um, where does manifest lists fit in? Uh, yeah, index. No, it's a great, great, great conversation um, because we've had that conversation with CNAB was the, the most prominent one about that. Uh, the last conversation we have, and I had to go back to look at the notes, we had general consensus amongst people that the same way we do a manifest config.media type, that we would have an index config media type. Um, and right now the index doesn't support that. Uh, we talked about how we'd version it and so forth, but that is the, the working plan, if you will. And the only reason we haven't pursued it yet was one, we felt like it wasn't necessarily a, and maybe we can discuss this in the, the one Oh spec, uh, cutoff, if you will, getting to a one Oh, we felt like, let's finish this, uh, with the manifest one. Cause we've literally only had CNAB that, uh, that, that theoretically needs it. Uh, and they're actually doing some changes on some things lately anyway with um, how they handle um, non-instance, uh, well, I forget what they call them, the, basically the, the root uh, image. Instead of putting the content in the image that there won't actually be an, a runtime image, there'll be this, uh, you can just bundle a set of artifacts with it. So I expect that will evolve more, but I, I wanted to get more concrete through this um, and then once we get that done, we would come back and address the config object. Yeah. Um, I mean, the reason why I'm asking is slightly off topic, but I was playing with manifest lists with, you know, the tribe uh, implementation and, you know, I got it to accept the arbitrary, uh, not arbitrary, I got it to accept the manifest list media type, but actually he used a Docker manifest command. I still couldn't push to the registry and I wasn't quite sure what was going on. And I did notice OCI distribution spec doesn't say anything about manifest list. So possibly it comes in at this spec? They, they got, uh, probably, I mean, Derek's on the call. I don't remember all the reasons why, but we push, the, it, the name got changed to in image index as if there were a list of images, which at this point manifest list is a more appropriate name for them. Okay, cool, I didn't know that. So if you look at the image spec slash image index dot MD, they're, they're effectively identical. Okay. Yeah, yeah I, I, act, I was implementing our experimental support for OCI for us last week and it, I literally just took our manifest list implementation and renamed it. Um, it works functionally identical. Have you tried working with the Docker client and the Docker manifest commands? With an image index or? Well, that would be, the, you know, that won't work on the index without, I assume that's a different media type, so. Yeah, it is a totally different media type, but it is, 
but structurally, it's more or less the same. Mm. Yeah, I assume I was missing something, or there's a bug in the Docker manifest command because I couldn't get it to work. Yeah, there are some bugs in there. I think Phil's tool is actually probably more up to date. His yeah, yeah, that's what I was going to recommend. I actually um, got it to work, so that's I, I was a bit skeptical about the Docker manifest stuff. I had a rewriting of the that manifest subcommand at some point, but it, it never finished because we were focused on it. <laughs> there's there's a lot of stuff in the back end that would need to get corrected, which we mostly did in container D. So I won't get into that, but uh, yeah, I, I would suggest using probably try that other tool. Okay, thanks. Hey, one of the things we discussed um, was kind of like this refactoring. Let me zoom out on this one a little bit is we do have some, and you know, the image spec and the distribution spec were built when there was this, um, the images, right? There was just basically the container runtime images. And now that we're reusing that for other examples, it does make things, uh, the, the factoring of them a little interesting. So we do have an open issue for refactoring this. Nobody's had time to go look at it, uh, where the idea is those, the manifest themselves, so both manif uh, for manifest, the schemas, for both manifest and index would in theory come out of those two specs or move up to distribution spec or something. The location is actually an interesting challenge as well. And then the idea is that the image spec actually is an implementation of the runtime image of as one artifact type uh, where in fact, you can see that here where Helm and singularity would also be of that type uh, where image spec actually uses index as well. And if you drew CNAB over here, it would, you know, in theory be um, both of those as well. So that's, that's one idea. It's an interesting question. It would be in the layers list or it would, it would replace the image, that man, image manifest, image manifest box. Sorry, say that again, Vincent. Are you saying it would take the place of that image manifest box or it would be listed in like the layers as a layer? Um, what I'm saying is that the image index and the image manifest, those two schemas are things that we're reusing for all artifact types. And in Im the image spec happens to be a, a type of artifact that sits within these two. Okay. Right. So if we, all three of these types use these, well, they use the manifest schema and they have their own config uh, media type to define how their layers uh, are used, as opposed to like these, these two, they're not ordinal layers. In fact, I think both of these happen to only use one. Uh, there was discussion at one point of Helm using two possibly, but I think there's still one. Uh, I thought I saw Josh, yeah. Um, Josh, what's the latest hey. on Helm? Latest in terms of? Is it one layer? Yeah, it's a single layer. Um, uh, what's it called? Compressed tarball. And there, you're not using the config object either? The content. Of the, no, the, the content in the config is actually, um, there's, a, there's a manifest in the chart package called chart.yaml. That's JSONified and that's the config. Okay. So if, and it's a total if, right? But if uh, somebody wanted to have uh, two layers for an artifact, and I'll, I'll use Helm as an example, where some of the information, the chart itself is one layer and other config parameter information, maybe default values of something might actually be another file that somebody could overlay then you would have two different layer types. Um, and that, you know, they're not overlays, they're actually different files used for different things. So, but it still fits within our whole registry uh, distribution implementation. So, um, and then, you know, the config object is optional as well. You can actually pass null into it and it works fine, or you can pass uh, a custom object. It sounds like the Helm team is using that. It doesn't even need to be JSON was one of the last calls we had. Uh, all you need to do is just change the extension. In fact, if you look at the latest update I've got here, um, I talked just uh, specifically about that uh, config. There's the config object. 
oh, um, here, optional config format. So it could just say config.v1. And there, if there's nothing in it, then there wouldn't be a .json. It wouldn't, you know, but if, if Helm wanted to do it as YAML, they could certainly do a .yaml and put content in there as well as the idea. But back to, sorry, I got a little bit off the question of refactoring. So the, the point here is this, these two schemas that we already have already support all this capability. It just so happens image spec uses it one way, Helm uses a slightly different way, Singularity uses a different way, and, and that's the beauty is these don't have to change. Um, there is the one change that we'd like to do here is put the config object on index. I think an interesting question for uh, getting to a 1.0 distribution spec might be, hey, do we maybe, I don't even think it's feasible, but does image index maybe become not image index, it becomes manifest index, which is I think what I heard you guys discussing. That would be uh, maybe not changing it, but anyhow. Because that's, that's not a, that's that's a different that's spec. Not, yeah, that's a different spec, and that would be a breaking change for the image spec, which is already v1. Yep. If it incorporated a new mine being mapped to a new mine, new mine type name, then we could figure that out later. But that's yeah. So that's there's been a couple like I had some feedback like why are we using layers in the artifact spec, and in fact I rewrote it, rewrote the feedback with using blobs. And then when I try to reference it back to the specs that do refer to them as layers, it just became too confusing. So I think this is the problem that a lot of people have, especially people that have been so invested in it for a long time, is they come up and they don't really understand what we try to do with the artifact stuff because we're so focused on how image uses them. Um, but if we can take a step back and generalize and it makes sense and just some of the names aren't the most generic of names, but the usage works perfectly well uh, generically. Okay, so we've got two minutes left for this section. Is there any other uh, discussions or thoughts? We certainly want more feedback in the PRs. There is this, this spec that we're looking here is a PR um, that uh, we're looking for feedback so that we can merge what's there with this, the newer feedback here. Um, Steve, a really quick question. Um, when we're talking about IANA registrations, um, did we did we determine that the actual layer media types would fall back on um, normal already known types, or is that just depending on the case? Uh, because with Helm, what we ended up doing, we originally had a custom type, but it was just a tarball, so we ended up using just application slash tar. Yeah, so you can. In fact, I, I don't know if Iana has application slash tar. If it is, I'll, I'll call it out here. But I did write this section. I updated this section to reflect that conversation. Um, so defining your layer types, there's, uh, and there's just the, you know, how do you want to think about the format? I, and do you split the layers? So here I'm referring to kind of the way OCI images are split. They're split due to size, um, amongst other things. And there's some stuff in here around deduping. Um, but you may split things because they're just, you want reuse and optimizations for other reasons. Um, so, and then there's a concept of layer versioning, and then there's the actual media types. So this is where this background of how you might split them could come into play. So if you're only doing one layer, and if you're not looking to version it, and it fits in one of the existing formats, then by all means, use this. Like, why, why does it need to, sorry, why does it need to be only one layer? It doesn't, own, oh, uh, great question. So um, if it's, if you're trying to have multiple layers and they're not just ordinal and because you're trying to use, let's say a conf, uh, config is not like default values and a manifest itself, then how do you differentiate? Is it, you just know to look layer zero is this or layer one, whichever you want to do. Um, instead of trying to just do ordinal base, you can actually use different names. Um, so where do I have an example of this? Uh, well, here's how well, much. I, I guess isn't isn't that more appropriate for like an annotation than um, creating a brand new media type if it's just a tar or JSON? Like I, I thought that that was kind of the conclusion we came to a few months ago. But well, the idea is it doesn't have to be a tar. 
like for instance, and the and you might decide to do this with Helm or not, but for the task logs, they're just fairly small log streams. They're not very big. The idea to have to tar them and compress them was overkill. So we're just storing them as text. Yeah. I, we're just doing application text. No, I, I understand. I'm just saying, like, let's say you have 10 layers and they're all text and you're asking now, how can I differentiate between the 10? If you um, need to. If you but, need oh, to. But I don't, I, I, sorry, go on. Go ahead, go ahead. I was going to say, like, I just don't, um, the way I'm kind of thinking about this now is that the only media type that we really need to register is the, for the content, for, for the actual high level of the new type itself. The right. individual layers, I think we should avoid at all costs being custom types. And if you do need to differentiate, um, BC, like, for example, between 10 different text files, I think the solution is by using um, some known annotation like open containers image name or something like that. And then you could just put different names on the text files instead of coming up with custom layer media types. That's my only comment. No, it's fair. I, and that's something that I've been contemplating about. I think to your point, most of them will probably fit in a single layer or an existing type. Um, my general struggle with annotations is I find them as kind of optional um, and not very definitive uh, from a registry. Like I expect that we will index them. And I think Joey does this more than anybody, uh, more than any of the registries is uh, index them to make rich metadata for people to query on them to as a registry for deduping and garbage collection and others, having a more precise understanding of what the types are uh, becomes much more meaningful. Um, but again, this is something I think we have to experiment more. Uh, if you have 10, 10 layers to your conversation, and they're literally, uh, well, it depends on what they're used for. The, one of the examples that we had was uh, one of the layers is a doc. You know, like a, here's the information on how to use this particular instance. Uh, it might be the source if you decide to put the source inside of as a layer as a separate art instead of another artifact type. By having that as known that this thing is uh, the source layer as opposed to the runnable layer, that might be interesting to somebody. Um, but I definitely wanted to tease out that if these fit, your existing generic formats fit, then by all means use them. So I wanted to ask Julie, uh, bring this up as well because it's a meta question that I have on the spec, which is given a set of layers with particular MIME types, how is, client, how is a client tool supposed to know what to do with those layers? And it seems like it's very artifact type specific. Um, and so I tend to believe two things. One is um, as long as we say that client tooling is only going to be able to handle layers on a per artifact type basis, then you can kind of have the freedom to put the, set the layer types to kind of whatever you want, right? If you want to have multiple layers of text and then it's up to the client tooling to understand that if it sees you know, an even number it needs to merge them and an odd number it needs to, you know, do a little dance, fine. Um, the second thing I, I would tend to prefer to say is if you're going to be putting supplemental information into an artifact, I would prefer we did that via um, an index or a manifest list as opposed to other layers that aren't used as part of the primary artifact, only because it means that we get into this nice ability on the registry side to be able to say, okay, here's the actual artifact and here's the stuff that goes along with it. So as a canonical example, we've been having conversations about, you know, how would you include source code with a container image? And I like the idea of having a manifest list that has two entries, one that's the container image itself and one that's the source reference. And I would prefer it that way as opposed to having the source reference be layers inside of the container image manifest, most notably because then tooling that handles container images today would have to be changed. And it would also, unless it was very intelligent, would have to download all those layers and replicate all those layers when, honestly, most of the times when you're operating a container image, you don't need the source associated with it. You just need a reference to it. So that, that seems to be, from my perspective, why a manifest list makes more sense um, for two distinct artifacts as opposed to mixing them together. But at a high level, if we, if we just say, you know, as long as it's very clear, like explicitly called out in the standard, client tools 
it's up to the client tools and the particular artifact type definition to, to explain how to process the layers after downloading them, if this thing is actually to be used, then generic tooling can just move the blobs along without any real insight, which is good. Yeah, so that's a great point. So uh, on the latter thing you're just mentioning, so that's exactly what I've captured here in the scenarios for the uh, software supply chain conversation. Uh, is I'm actually am using an index for the image, the SBOM, and the source, and each would then be signed. So that's, I completely agree. In that example, it probably makes perfect sense to have it as an index because you want them separately. Because if you look all the way to the right, you'll notice over here in the deployment area, uh, I no longer care about the source. It's still in the registry. I'm just not using it anymore. And I might have implemented some deploy configuration that needs to be persisted, uh, for instance. Um, so I think this is, uh, and to your other point, uh, it is up to tools. So up in here, defining a unique artifact type, it is expected that uh, an image, uh, something that runs the runnable image, you know, container D, Docker, uh, are not meant to deal with Helm charts. That's not, that's not the format that they were designed for. And it gives them to do what they want in their format. And that's what Singularity was able to benefit from as well. Um, but I definitely wanted to make sure that the layer types uh, had these as options. And I think that's the thing that we'll watch is that if most people can just use these, then I think we're fine. And that's just a sample list, right? You're talking any IANA. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I, strangely, I didn't find that many in IANA for generic. Um, so I was kind of, I was actually a little surprised that I didn't find more of them and uh, for things like, you know, uh, I think even text, I couldn't find an application slash text. It was text slash and there's various other values in there. JSON XML were in there, um, but I couldn't find as many as I thought I would find there. Well, okay. I mean, we can talk later, but I thought like, um, like text slash plain would be considered uh, those are other great examples as well. Okay. Um, I did not find very many. I think people use those generically. Like if you do a search on the internet for various uh, media types, their people have some standards they've created. They just never got registered with IANA. So if you look here, and we're coming up to the half an hour, so I was trying to, but if you just look in this list, um, like text or a slash text, like in fact, there's nothing here. Uh, well, here's text slash. Is there a text slash? Plan? Yeah, that's that's kind of what I was talking about. Like CSS, is there? Yeah. There? See, these I found, but I just didn't find like plain old text. Um, and there was, I can't remember the I other think that's, I think that's text plain, probably. There is no text plain. Interesting. Yeah, I, I that was kind of where I was a little, you know, lost a little bit and then individual vendors went off and did things uh, and there's obviously lots of other ones in the section so you know for the sake of time I, by all means please people have been giving me great feedback by looking digging into some of these that's how we stumbled across this it took me a while to go through and read the various specs and get my head wrapped around it um, so uh, that and that came from this feedback process Anything else before we shift off to Vincent? Vincent, it's all yours. Oh no. I should have actually prepared something when you emailed me this morning. <clears throat> um, so the, the, the biggest part, how much, how much of a time slot did you allocate? Uh, half an hour. But uh, what's after you? Uh, the supply chain thing, unless William pops on, I haven't seen him yet. Um, mm -hmm. It'll be, I, I probably have 15 minutes depending on the conversation because it, as we put in the Slack channel, it's really a scoping conversation just to let people know where we're at on some of the other conversations. So go as much as you want. Sure. Um, it's, it's really pretty straightforward. Let me see if I can just get a single browser window. So what we'll be talking about is the distribution spec 1.0, which is a lot of what you have just touched on. Well, I mean, not a lot, but 
most of what you're touching on is uh, ostensibly the, the relates to the image spec um, for the distribution spec. Most of this is already hopefully stabilized. Um, yeah, this and this. So um, we do have a um, a couple of open open issues on the, the distribution spec and the milestone that I, I don't think has really been tidied up. Um, the the thing about the distribution spec that makes it slightly different than the image and runtime spec is that we were there was more iteration on the image and runtime spec back in 2015 to 2017 um, as we were developing the tools that were using it um, as the this registry API that um, all the different folks that are dialing into the calls from you know, the Docker Hub and from Amazon's registry and Quay and Azure and GCR um, and Harbor as, as we could get the time zone right. Um, this is already like in place and so even though this is somewhat in a release candidate March at this point um, towards a 1.0 it's practically already in production, so we're just trying to smooth off a lot of the rough edges that folks have already found, you know, certain endpoints or otherwise that everybody wishes to get rid of because they already disable them where they can or um, were never good behaviors to begin with. So if we do make effectively a breaking change, that it's one that we could all make together and then have some um, idea for uh, deprecating it, like. You know, the, getting rid of the catalog API for those that pay close attention. Um, but um, most notably, there's just a couple of things outstanding for um, smoothing out this March to a 1.0. There, there are four notary, uh, particularly there's thoughts about how to use the registry effectively fold back in what's needed for the registry um, using what we've already done. Um, and so there, there's the idea that everybody's very familiar with push pull, otherwise like basic container image workflows for a registry. Um, but practically speaking, it's just a content addressable storage with some kind of a tagging mechanism. Um, which helps for garbage collection or ACLs and otherwise. And so there could be behaviors like for notary storing and otherwise signatures um, that just reuse this content addressable storage, almost like a look aside cache. Um, and so these things could be done additively to the registry API, the distribution spec without breaking existing functionality. And so how do we, before 1.0, at least stub out some kind of additive extension so that you can see, oh, this registry supports the things that I need to be able to store signatures in it or something like that. Um, and so we've started walking through that. Um, in that same kind of ad, you know additive extension proposal, uh, the, the big other one is effectively the, the, the successor to the catalog API and um, Joey Shore that's on the line here has a proposal up for a events pub sub type model. Um, and these things are kind of like signatures for notary and then other stuff for like discovering the, the number of images you have um, or new images that come out would be some kind of an extension to that registry API. Um, so the, I don't think that anything particular with the notary v2 is going to be a, any kind of a blocker, but we're just at a, a kind of a, a sus suspension moment where as some of the dust is settling and everybody's like trying to agree upon the approach that we can do that before this 1.0 settles or at least fold it back in early enough. Uh, so now's the time for that kind of like request for comment in the registry API and how best to use it. Um, and then as we are now moving from the use case 
use case and requirements model for Notary V2, uh, that, it, that it becomes like a very, very concrete example of how some of these would get used and how it would integrate back into the registry API. Um, Derek uh, McGowan, who's on the line also here, he and I had a, a, a decent call this week um, talking about how to reuse the registry API and just starting to stub out some basic routes that um, don't exist for notary, but like playing through the use case. And this is where we're going to have to obviously get much more on the notary side of what's the workflow that's needed and what are the kind of endpoints and, you know, security contexts and whatnot uh, for actual, you know, pushing, pulling, fetching, seeing, deleting, updating, whatever, revoking signatures that are attached to a signed blob uh, or signed label tag. Um, this is a straw man just to have a conversation, but this is the kind of uh, these two worlds combining or kind of overlapping in the Venn diagram of what endpoints would be useful for notary and needed for notary, like a notary signature extension to use a registry. Um, so that we know that what we're doing and going to stamp as a distribution 1.0 um, enables that. Uh, so we don't have to uh, bolt on solutions too, too terribly. Um, so I'm going to pause for a second because there's um, to, probably a lot of clarification that I could provide that I don't know that I've just skipped over of like how the OCI distribution spec and notary overlap. Um, but please raise your hand or whatever um, so I can help answer questions when I don't know how to get to that raise hand view. Is the idea here that, because um, I'm just looking at the things where the using signatures as an example, but it was this, but because this is the extension proposal, is the idea here that I could put some extensions on a repo or on the registry as a whole? Because I'm, I'm just having a little bit of reaction to the. No, it'd be a re it would be a registry. The registry owner would know, would, would, I mean, that's a clever idea, but no, it's not talking about namespacing it to where you'd say my, my repo only can respond to Correct. this thing. Uh, Derek, do you, Derek or Joey, do you have particular thoughts on folks enabling extensions per namespace? So we would like for anything new that we implemented, we would likely whitelist particular namespaces and or repositories for testing. But from my perspective, the way we would do that is if you hit the API for an unsupported namespace or registry, we would just simply return a unsupported HTTP code. Um, so tooling would still be able to discover that we support it as, as a product, that particular extension, and then they tried to operate against that particular namespace or repository, we would just return a code. And likely that would be a temporary, so, uh, a temporary uh, state Roll until off. such time as we, we fully implemented and or fully tested and or added some new feature or something. So that's my gut instinct. Um, I, I could, I, I could see a scenario where, you know, an administrator may want to have certain extensions enabled for certain namespaces, maybe even repositories, but I haven't heard a concrete answer yet where not having the discovery mechanism work is required for that versus just reporting an unsupported code if it's disabled explicitly for whatever reason. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, then, and the repo space, I wasn't necessarily talking about like root repos where we use those to disambiguate different customers, right? The multi-tenant nature, I was more thinking there. And I, and I wasn't, it's an interesting idea that maybe a production repo might have or not have a certain capability. But the, if you scroll down a when little bit. Repo, are you talking about like container registry at a whole? A path, no, that, sorry, the oh, path. path. If you okay. scroll down a little bit or move the screen up, so to speak, because I've seen Mac and Windows and Linux people get, have different opinions of what up and down means. Um, I was looking at the line where it says get and post put the second grouping where the signatures are on a yeah. repo. Yeah. I was uh, this, was, one. this was just us trying to, Derek and I was trying to work through, <clears throat> in my mind, uh, extensions would be, the, the difference between these two groups here was just that um, 
within an, the extension directory, whatever extension that you register or describe, be it events or signatures or whatever, would then be its name and then that's the new prefix for any like effectively sandboxed extensions that you describe like any endpoints. Um, the, the, the thing that, that Derek was saying is that for most registries, the ex existing like top level and then name uh, already has a lot of like ACL logic built in. So you'd, you'd register an endpoint or, you know, so there'd be some, something over here, ignore this part. It'd be something over here where you could discover the extension that a registry might support, but that the actual me mechanisms would integrate back across um, existing endpoints. So you'd oh, register things. So this is, uh, this is basically trying to think through something that's wholly outside of the known endpoints and would be sandboxed or relegated to a prefix. Uh, and this, this is the approach thinking through it, integrating it, you know, whatever extensions the registry does support get integrated back across or back through known endpoints. Um, and there's, those, those, there's more discussion about that. Um, but, and uh, th this is the kind of thing that just using something like signatures as a discussion point, how best for registry operators to handle the ACLs and the garbage collection and uh, whatever else. And, and some of this even gets into like, um, should we yeah, have a, a, delimiter, a delimiter yeah. here so that we know, you know, if we have more than just a two part, you know, VBATS, my app repo name, if it goes like multi stages deep, how to delimit towards all these other things that are happening here. Um, yeah. I mean, just thinking out loud about this, yeah, I, I put that proposal with the underscore. I, I mean, I, I would like, I see us having a need for both. There's going to be like, so the pubs of proposal that I, I put out, um, most of the endpoints are, are kind of universal, right? Because you're subscribing at different levels, but the, the level is part of the subscription. So it's not under, it's not homed under a particular repository, mm -hmm. but uh, notary signatures and other kinds of extensions like that could absolutely be homed under a particular repository. So I, I, dare well, I, and, that, and that's even where it's something that, that, uh, you know, I went back and forth on because you might, you might sign, you know, in a top level image, like I might push and sign VBATS my app, but you know, particular creator of like a layer, um, I'll pick on Red Hat, my employer, might push out a base image layer, you know, and they're not signing the config manifest and all that jazz. They might actually be signing like an object that is a tar layer of something. Um, and so you might want to recurse back through and see like, actually, you know, one of the layers in my stack has a signature that exists for it. You know, so like if you wanted to sit and check in something like this, like show me the uh, signatures on this object and it might not have a name on it per se, but it might be, a, you know, an object in the stack that somebody has attested to. And the ACLs here get tricky because um, what if somebody's just pushing arbitrary signatures? Anyhow, that's getting in the weeds, but this, this is the kind of thing of like, where it, it, should it go back across the stack? Is it only at the top level named object or is it any object at all? Um, yeah, I, I agree with you. And I think that's, I think we need to unfortunately leave the flexibility in place for both those options. And then it's going to co really come down to the very specific extension as to how we're going to handle ACL. It's going to have to be part of the design of the extension and how it's going to affect these other paths. But there's, I, I can easily think of multiple scenarios where you need both a extension specific endpoint that's not tied to a particular namespace or repository and ones that should be tied to the existing ACL. Um, and they could very well and likely will exist within the same extension. So as lo so long as we reserve both sets of paths and say, you know, if you define it as SIGs, you get it both here and there, then at least there's flexibility for the future. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because you have somebody, yeah. Yeah, that's well. That's why I added that. You know, let's have a, a delimiter in there or something between the repo name and the extension name. I don't, it doesn't have to be underscore. I just 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that, that's what that's pretty much the same thing of like if you otherwise you have to kind of do a head and a tail. To, yeah. Yeah. Um, so uh, this 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 is probably one having having at least any kind of an idea on this. It, it, even this could be added after a 1.0 of the of the registry, but it's all in the, the dust settling kind of phase um, along with even really, really simple stuff that I think nobody's just cared to think about, but like the readme is just pretty bare minimum um, and getting it out the door, but it, it, it's for all intents and purposes already in, produ uh, in production as it, as it is and the conformance that work that um, Josh and Peter have been working on is I think really driving some really good conversations, finding that even when this was the registry API documentation over on the, the, the Docker distribution project, that um, there was kind of a skew of conformance as, as it was. Um, and so we're having really, really productive conversations about what even exists in the wild versus what's documentation versus, you know, all the different places. So uh, if any of that's in, of interest to you, feel free to reach out and get involved. Um, but that's a would, yes, quick please. question here. Assuming you can hear me. Okay. What's up? Super. Um, uh, do you have a timeline for when this goes like fully 1.0? Mm -hmm. Sorry. <laughs> Asking the hard questions. I know, but like you can say, but like we don't have one. You can say six months. Like I just want to um, know, like the you know. Uh, I can I can only set aspirations on this. Um, I, okay. Uh, the same kind of same kind of comments and back and forth happened with the image and runtime spec that all of us set what we thought was conservative estimates and they ended up coming and going. Um, even with the distribution spec, everybody was like, oh, it seems to already be like in use. And this was before all the conformance stuff started happening. Um, we thought it would be done by the end of 2019. Um, that has come and passed already. Um, so there's been probably more activity on this in the last uh, three months than in the prior three or six months. Um, and it is getting closer. I'm not, I'm not, I have no magic eight ball to say it'll happen in some time frame. Uh, I would love for it to be done now, but that's it. It's not quite ready for that. Okay. It sounds like I should take my question offline and we'll work out what timing actually looks sure. like. Sure, sure, That's sure. fine. I'll probably get a, um, I mentioned on the, the OCI call last Wednesday that I'd like to get an RC2 vote up. Um, and the, uh, the, the, the things that spun off out of that, um, so basically, it was, it was it was less of a timeline and more of just a nature of the beast, time, you know, kind of uh, estimation. When we were doing the other ones, was that we'd get an RC out and then look for what kind of things that people were like, oh, this needs to be in. And as that toned down, um, then we're like, okay, there's not really really been any changes since the last RC. We'll do one more RC, and the next after that will be the final. Um, that's kind of what I, I would I want to get an RC out the RC two out the door, um, release candidate two, and then see what's next. And from me, kind of surfacing that not from but in 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 a, the same moment of me representing that I want to get an RC two out the door. Um, Josh and Peter were like, we found so many inconsistencies. It would be great to just do a big pass over the spec so we'll probably have a working session where we just kind of reorganize some of the spec there will be fallout from that i'm sure um so whether we do an rc before or after that and then just kind of tidy it up because it's un certain things are just unclear in the spec and that, a lot of that's just the cruft of time a hey, re really quick on that point um so me and peter sat down this morning um and kind of look through the spec and uh, I put a link in the chat but we put together a hack MD or Peter I should say but um, of the possible things that might make 
everything a bit more clear. Um, and then also on that point, the, so I sent the email out last week to do a working session and I got quite a bit of uh, people interested in that. So I don't know if we want to make that more of an official um, session, but. Sure. Do you want to do it? How soon do you think is not soon enough? Tomorrow, Wednesday? Uh, yeah, I mean, I was kind of thinking if we do Wednesday prior to the actual call, but I'm not sure. I don't know if we have an agenda this Wednesday, and since we're not all in Amsterdam. Say we, we could just stomp on this Wednesdays. Make that the call? Okay. All right, I'll respond on the mailing list with that. Yeah, I'll, I'll second it. Because we, we used, that's in the, the march towards 1.0 for image and runtime, that, that ended up being some of it of just like, we're taking over this hour and just make it clear on like the, the weekly meeting, you know, weekly email out that like, this is all we intend to talk about or work on in the hour. Yeah, that sounds good. Cool. Well, let's just call that now. I mean, we don't have an agenda yet. Everybody, you know, it, so I, I think it's fine just to call it now. My problem is I haven't had time to dial into some of these because that, that hour is blocked out and I've been busy with some other stuff. So I think that'd be great. Okay. Consider it called. Um, is there any other questions folks have about this right now? Is your idea that in, we wouldn't necessarily hold for notary, but if we do the extensions, that's the placeholder that we can stick lots of things in? Is that kind of the assumption? Um, lots is maybe being exciting. You, uh, I, I do have to say boring. Um, it's just a place to have a kind of um, additive conversation. Additive is the term that keeps coming to mind that um, it wouldn't be breaking and there'd probably be peer reviews once it, they're not probably, there would definitely be peer reviews to get merged in the distribution spec pages about this. Um, but others could have a framework very similar to, you know, BitTorrent extensions, the BEP process or Python PEP. Um, otherwise, uh, that folks could try things out, you know, and, and even if they're, they're trying out some new thing in their own local registry that they can discover it and try it out and it doesn't exist upstream. Um, but if you want it to be generally reviewed, they could. Um, so it's, it's more just getting the framework in place for that. Um, and just using something that's not, uh, that's the, pro that's the, pro the danger with specs is, you know, just arbitrarily contriving things that don't exist, you know, for your use case, uh, as opposed to, saying like with the events endpoint or the sig signature endpoint, like pretty tangible, you can start discussing the, you know, the, the types of workflows or whatever that's needed. How does that affect the existing API? How does it integrate through? Um, that really, really, really helps in describing that kind of um, endpoint. Um, so, like I said, it shouldn't be blocked by the signatures or one shouldn't block the other. They just make for this is the time to have that discussion and it's good to have a very tangible use case um, to when describing something like this extensions endpoint or extension aspect. That's all. No, no, I, I look, if it was gonna get anything into the 1.0 spec to have something that says, here's how you add extensibility to it, that seems like the right, great one. But to your point, not having a concrete use case makes it kind of hard. So maybe between notary or the pub sub thing that Joey's working on, um, I don't know of others that we've been discussing. We, we, I don't know of others that have actually had some concrete execution. Like we've talked about a search API and some other things, but there's, we haven't had any traction yeah, on that. Yeah, I was that. about to say, the other ones that kind of loosely bang around there are search APIs or some other kind of like endpoint to this is where it gets effectively in the search API, but some way to like query for, you know, like right. what architectures are, you know, something that gets down into the configs that right now has to be built in the outside indexing kind of thing. And if somebody wanted to do that and, you know, pr pr 
propose it and you know, have like, if you wanted to expose this index endpoint, like, okay, sure. That, but those get a little long in the tooth. And this is just like what the, what the very common critical use case that everybody could discuss. Um, great, that's fine. I, don't, I do not expect it to be many. I expect it to be a bare minimum and then a place for people to experiment with. But have you thought about how extensions register what APIs they get called on so that there's some uniqueness? Is that, was that part of what was in there or? How extensions register? If I have a foo extension, or was that kind of what you were getting at is they would hang off the root or it hang off the a repo? Like what would be the API name of my foo API that I want to add? Um, and how do we, avoid collisions like is the yeah that's, that's pretty much the the discussion there is like i wouldn't mind those things being sandboxed um because if they're but as long as whatever name that you register so I, at first I was, I was trying to make this thing almost recursive that anything describing the types of extensions are nested under some name initially but um in the sig signatures example, that like dollar sign name would be SIGs. If they wanted to put something that might, it might be prudent to go ahead and make that like SIGs V1 or V0 as we iterate on that. Um, so that that extension itself takes on the ownness of um, versioning it. Uh, I, I have not gone so far as to propose something like Kubernetes style um, versioning, you know, V1 alpha one, V1 beta one, V1. Um, but for, for the, like they do for the CRDs, um, but the name, the name would carry that. So if, if they changed it, then it would have to change the extension name and that would subsequently affect all the endpoints that 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 extension um, provides or does. Um, that's really it. It would it would have to be worked into the path, like those two conversations, whether they're sandboxed or whether they're integrated back across the registry endpoints. But the name registered for an extension would be worked into the path. So if it ever needed to change due to versioning or otherwise, that that would affect everywhere that that path is integrated. Yeah, it was the CRDs that was making me wonder if there's a prior art, so to speak, that we could leverage there. Because, but I love the the ACL conversation. So it's, it's good. I'll have to see if I get Sajay or others to look at it. Yep. 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 Cool. Okay. Uh, if there's any other questions, uh, you can direct them to me or somewhere in this in this chat. But uh, uh, we do have some milestones that folks are trying to tag. And if there's an issue that you see needs to be raised, issue it and say, please tag this for a V1 milestone piece. Um, but otherwise I'll yield the floor to the next person. Anybody else up for the spec 1.0 conversation? Okay, so give me a second, get my screen. And let me, uh, I saw the comments. Let me try changing the resolution of my screen here um, to something more reasonable for sharing. I won't go all the way down by eight by six, but. That's the one I want. Okay. And put that back up. Wow, that looks really strange. But okay. Um, so the next one was just where we're at on some of the the so, uh, secure supply chain work. So here, there we go. Screen two. Um, so I and I saw some of the conversation in some of the Slack channel on that. So the 
the conversation here on some of the supply chain effort, because remember this, this call or this meeting that we were going to have in KubeCon was more a matter of a bunch of various efforts that various people are working on. Um, it wasn't necessarily all grounded in OCI, such as Notary V2 is actually in CNCF. Uh, it's just a, a collaborative effort. The, um, there's been a couple of things that we've discussed as part of Notary V2, um, such as pedigree and um, uh, what's the other pedigree and oh, I even wrote it in here. Um, Uh, pedigree and providence. Um, and the the thought process is that there's a certain amount of things that we should be doing with notaries, such as the, the ability to sign something, but it's not necessarily meant to be everything to everybody. So in the scenarios doc that we've got under requirements, I did call out specifically this kind of uh, working flow. Um, so if we look at this imagery, and this is, Joey was kind of referencing this before, I was using the stuff that Joey and I'm not sure if Joey and Vince have been working on this together or just they've been talking about it terribly, but the idea that I might have source uh, that I need to ship alongside my runnable artifact, my, my artifact, in this case, a runnable image, um, or I have a generic SBOM that I want to have in this thing. The idea is that from a notary perspective, um, for it's, it's not very um, uh, sensitive to colorblind people, so I apologize. I realized that as I uh, wrote, did this, but the blues are meant to be what we're trying to do from a notary perspective, meaning we're signing things, don't care what we're signing, we're signing things, uh, and it can move across registries. One of the things that we could sign is in SBOM. Um, and there is a couple of different efforts that are going on. One of them is this uh, 3T, uh, SBOM conversation and there's conversations even what they're going to continue to call themselves. But the idea is that uh, at the end of the day, um, there's a whole bunch of things that happen to the left of uh, what happens before it gets into a registry, how images, uh, content is built, how it's uh, attestation and compiled and so forth. And the idea is that uh, at the end or one of the ends, uh, is that there can be a document that says, here is what makes up this thing. Um, and it can be everything from the packages that were used to the compiler that was used um, and all kinds of other information. So uh, that work has been going pretty well um, as all open source projects go. There's lots of back and forth and trying to scope things. And the only part that I've been trying to make sure from our effort is that if there, you know, is there going to be a single document at the end um, that accompanies the things that are done um, so that we can say, look, we, we can sign this thing. We can group them together in some way that we know that this SBOM that categorizes what the content is is associated with another artifact, such as an image or, or a source. And that we can move this from the vendor's source where they, the vendor's uh, published location. I don't want to confuse source with source code. Uh, but location of where that vendor comes up with, gets it into a public registry, moves it over to that customer's registry, and then they can have that content. And uh, this right here is where you see the conversation of generic imagery came up. I was trying to look for a generic policy management uh, icon and all I was left with the OPA shield without OPA on it. Uh, the idea here is that uh, uh, some policy management system can look at this SBOM, again, we don't care, uh, but the idea is that we can at least attest that it is valid. It has a signature, it, it is what it claims to be. Um, and as long as the keys are continued to be you know, valid, that the policy manager can act on that very efficiently. Um, one of the things that I've been trying to uh, keep an eye on is making sure that these supply chain efforts that as they go through from development to build, to publishing, to production, is that the closer we get to production, the faster we want the thing to be um, evaluated and allowed through or not. Uh, we get in a lot of these conversations on image scanning. Um, uh, do you rescan something every time it goes to deployment? Or can you look at the digest and know that, hey, I've already seen this thing before. So until somebody tells me it's no longer valid, I'm going to know that I've seen it before, I saw it within a safe period of time, 
and I'll very quickly let it through. Uh, the idea is the work is done up front to scan the content and know that uh, you're, you're happy with that thing before it goes through. And uh, the analogy is, you know, you go to the airport, you show them your passport, uh, and they look at it for the 3D uh, you know, imagery to make sure that the, the document is valid, they scan, and the number is quickly evaluated to know that you're not on some uh, government watch list or otherwise, as long as those two things are good and, and you actually match the picture to whatever evaluation that person is doing, that you're al quickly allowed through. You're not asked to represent all the, the information that gave you that passport in the first place. So that's kind of all I'm trying to scope things here um, from what we've been doing. Um, and at least from the, uh, the working group that's been with, uh, and I see Santiago here um, uh, with the notary and the uh, in Toto stuff that um, are tough, that there's a document coming together with SPDXs also that are trying to get some format put to that that have that documents done, we could sign it. So that's, yeah, that's so I, I, I was curious about that. Uh, you mentioned that there's a relationship work being done here, as in uh, how to relate artifacts to each other, which I think it's uh, crucial for supply chain integrity. Uh, could you elaborate a little bit more on that? Or Yeah, so basically if we look at the gray boxes, the, the idea is that, uh, and this is you know, why it's good to have all these different groups working together, because we see them as separate problems that cumulatively uh, makes for a better end-to-end -end solution that each area is managed. So from a registry perspective, if we just think of, think of these things as generic artifacts, and then we can store an artifact in a registry and sign it. So for instance, the SBOM document that uh, you and Kate have been working on, that could be put into a registry signed and it has some, and this is the part that we haven't figured out yet, but I, I assume with the notary signatures, it'll happen as well. Uh, group these two together, or it might just be grouped because they're both in an index, the OCI index. So now I can have an index that says, here's the image, here's the SBOM, potentially here's the source. Because when you get all the way to the right, when I deploy this to my cluster, I don't want to deploy the SBOM. I don't want to deploy the source. All I really need is the image. So we don't want the image, for instance, payload to have the SBOM in it. We don't even necessarily I don't know how to handle this, think about the signature yet, but the idea is we want the, each element to be as small as possible to just define its space so that, that that's all it needs and it can go on. So the idea is that artifacts are things such as an SBOM and it's signed and there's a correlation between the two. At the worst case, there's an index that pulls the two together. I don't know what yet what we'll do on a better, uh, better example than that. I'm hoping the notary stuff will start to surface in that. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, yeah, I would like to take a look at this because I mean, this is something we've done a lot of research and there's many ways you can get it slightly wrong and uh, open a big gaping hole in the supply chain integrity front. Uh, that's also partly why uh, I think it would be important for the, I mean, an SBOM can refer to an image as far as I'm aware and uh, the and linking should be done. Can, uh, can. can. Uh, so what I think it would be crucial for a uh, like a registry, say notary, to do the snapshotting and the linking of the attestation on an SBOM and the image itself. Uh, I think at least that's what Tuff is doing in the case of Datadog, for example. You get a you get your artifact and then you get the SBOM on it, and then you get all of the underlying attestations that you can quickly chain together. Uh, I wouldn't be too worried about the about the performance on that. You, it's basically a couple of uh, string comparisons and a couple of if you want to make it very efficient, 825.519 signature checks. Yeah, so this is uh, why I've been watching and just trying to keep up with what's going on to make sure that they do kind of meet some of the, the goals that we've kind of outlined here, is that we can achieve this. Yep, technically this shouldn't be terribly difficult to do. You can, in fact, do this with Notary V1 right now. Uh, as Radu has showed, building a proof of concept for the CNAP security stuff, you can already do this. Uh, the suggestions that there are some security improvements that that would be great, uh, but we can we can already do a minimal working example of this, and that's why I filed the key management issues, some of the security issues that are related to that. 
Uh, the second thing that Santiago is talking about is that you may not want to sign everything, like the snapshot metadata, for example, and that's something that can be done by the registry. Shouldn't be forced, but we should allow for it. Agreed. Yeah, I think similar to the artifact conversation earlier, there, there's no, there's very few musts per se. It's more a matter of what can I do? Um, and the idea here, just purely from a notary perspective, as long as we can sign content, because if I have an SBOM, but there's no way to prove that that SBOM didn't change from point A to point B, then it doesn't really carry a lot of weight the same way that an image might change from point A to point B or any artifact. So the main thing we want to do is just be able to say that as these artifacts move within a registry or across registries that we know, or and then to an endpoint, uh, such as all the way over here, uh, that we know that they're still in the same state that they were intended to be, then you know, that unlocks the possibility that I can, this, this uh, policy manager, for instance, can look at this document and make decisions on it because it can trust that that document is still has its integrity associated with it. Uh, so for some context, this is just a, a funny uh, like notion. Uh, in, in total, verifying an SBOM creates an attestation. So if you want to do this type of offloading of the computation down the line, then you can on the public registry, verify the SBOM and create a sign attestation from the public registry that says I verified this SBOM and then pass that attestation down. Uh, I think this type of semantics are what's important because it allows you to do a lot of interesting things and also uh, uh, make things more efficient later down the line. Yeah, exactly. I mean, this is why, you know, me sitting kind of outside of these and hearing Vincent and others talk about stuff that at Red Hat you guys are doing, like the reason I purposely did the SBOM with the lowercase O was to be more generic uh, because Red Hat might decide not to use the 3T SBOM format. They have a different one that they decide is valuable to their customers. From a registry signature perspective, we shouldn't care, right? It should just work. And they might have a different policy manager, but if somebody wants to use OPA and a 3T SBOM, that should work as well. Obviously there's a, a coupling. This thing that's reading this document has to know what it's reading, so to speak. But um, we really just want to facilitate as many different uh, projects that want to move content through. So yeah, I'm, look, I'm really looking forward to the work you guys are doing. I was really hoping William was going to be able to join, although I didn't ask him last minute, to be fair, uh, to kind of give an update there. So, uh, hi, this is Nisha. Yeah, Nisha. Um, one thing that I'm having a hard time wrapping my head around is the relationship between the, the work that's going on in the distribution spec and the uh, artifacts spec required uh, if there, there were any considerations there for how these different artifacts are linked together. So the, the scenario that comes to mind is you have, you have an existing image uh, that has, uh, that's from a supplier that has uh, you, you know, the ability to build your Golang uh, app. So you use the image, you add your app, you, you probably you know, use a client to go and make uh, your uh, resulting image. So at that point, you would need to generate an SBOM. Uh, you might want to include sources uh, and you might want to sign all those. Uh, you might want to sign the, the, those resulting artifacts. Um, how, would you, how would you account for any additions that come up, you know, uh, on top of existing images? Or is that something that um, we're not thinking about right now? I'm, so it's a good question. If I, let me clarify to understand, make sure I understand. So if are you, I assume you can see my screen here. So um, we've got an image and there's an SBOM as a separate artifact in the registry is what I'm showing here. And I think what you're saying is if the SBOM from here to the next step has some added metadata that gets added to it. Is that what you're asking yeah. about? Yeah, so I mean that this is how folks use container images, right? They'll say from and they'll uh, they'll put stuff on top of it. So this is, uh, at, this is at build time. 
So, um, I mean, it, it, it's all, this is all well and good if you're like building everything from scratch, but what happens when you start augmenting on top of it? No, that's fair. Um, so that's two aspects. So there is one, I have built artifacts that I'm not changing the content, but I want to add some other information to it. I might say that in my company, I have some other attestation or something else that I might want to add to the SBOM. So I'll come to your rebuild scenario in a second. But in that, in this, in this case that I was just going into, I might have a second SBOM because you're right. I can't change this SBOM because it's got a signature that says this, I intentionally say it's not changed. I can add another SBOM that references this one is my understanding how the team is doing it so that they're more hierarchy. Um, and the new one gets signed, but the old SBOM is still there and it's still signed. So I can kind of see the lineage, uh, if you will. Um, pop out the chat window because I'm sure I'm not missing something. Uh, okay, um, so just being more generic here. So the that's kind of the, the generalization there and uh, Trishank is kind of referring, I'll, I'll turn it over to him in a second here. From, so that's one model. The model that you're getting at is another conversation we've been having is if I take an Ubuntu based image uh, and it's signed or maybe even a rail, a rail image because there's, you know, there's certainly a, a backing on that. Um, and I now add my application to it. Is there some concept that when I've rebuild it with a from statement from a rel image, what do the signatures look like? Um, at this point, what we're saying is there's a signature on the, the newly built image. Uh, we had an open conversation around how should we think about uh, base layers and should base layers, and base layers are meaning any base, right? That's like second layer. Anytime there's a from statement, which it itself might have three froms underneath it. But the point is, is any in layers that I'm referencing in the thing I built, is there something about the signature chain that we might be able to leverage? I still see that as an open issue. We haven't figured that one out yet, uh, just because the way layers kind of get moved within a registry, not all registries do deduping. It's when the deduping is done, um, but it's an interesting conversation. So at this point, at least for now, uh, the current working thought and actually, uh, uh, Vincent and others have spent more time on this, is the thing that gets built, gets signed. And I'll, I'm seeing Derek's face here. Is there any work, or Vincent, is there anything that's been thought about on the layer signature stuff, being able to carry to another image that gets built? Uh, that was what I was alluding to earlier, is just like concrete use cases, but the ACLs of that get a little tricky. I, I feel like there should be a way that we sign layers, but it, it at the point at which you ask for like an arbitrary list of what all issuers have attested to a particular object, then that's to imply that anybody could push a signature regardless of ACLs. And then registry maintainers have a, you know, registry owners, operators have a, a situation at their hands. If anybody can just push arbitrary signatures and have an unbounded list of these objects being shoved at the registry uh, with no ACLs, that gets a little funky. So how do you actually say, no, this is exactly my object or I attest something about this object. That, that, talk, that, that discussion has to be teased out further. Um, it is definitely something we're thinking about, but it, I don't have any uh, particular epiphany on how to handle it yet. Yeah, we talked about having the signatures cover not just the manifest, but everything under it. So the problem right now is like you sign a manifest, the manifest links to all the layers underneath it. Um, but then if you build something from that manifest, that original manifest is gone. So unless you also push that new manifest up to your new repository, there wouldn't be a good way to link kind of the, those layers back to that signature. Uh, so, you know, the possibility is that the, me make sure the signatures cover all the layers and everything that's part of an image and then you as a builder, when you build something from some base image and you take those signatures, you can just push those back up. Um, and while that repository may not have that manifest, uh, if it's also covering those layers, you'd be able to make use of that. So that, that was just one kind of idea, but yeah, we need to figure out what the best way to do that is. Yeah, it's kind of linked with the SBOM work I'm doing too, because at this point, um, 
like I have a tool that can generate an SBOM for a whole container image, but it, it gets pretty large depending upon what kind of image you're using. I'm thinking about um, the, uh, the use case of cloud native build packs, for example. So if you were using build packs, you would end up with the container image that has many, many, many layers. Um, Generating an S bomb for that ends up being really huge. The S bomb becomes very huge. So, it 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 seems to me that um, it makes more sense if you know the the S bomb was generated uh, on a per layer basis and stored with. Uh, I mean, in that scenario, it would be easier if the SBOM was stored with each layer, in which case, how does signing work? Um, and if you're, if you're thinking about that kind of ecosystem, then, you know, that, that is, that's just one concrete scenario that I can think of. Hi, yeah. Um... So th this is interesting because this is at least three issues that we have seen before in practice. So, so I'm glad you brought it up. The first thing is, let me see if I remember this. How do you make sure, okay, so you have SBOM for one step for your package. Let's say it's a, it's a container image and then now you wanna build other images off of it. And that has its own SBOM materials. The good news is that at least in Dodo has solved this problem. There's ways to do it. So, you have rules for your supply chain and your own supply chain can refer to the rules for the other supply chain. If that makes sense at all. So for example, you say, I trust the base Alpine image, for example, and here's the SPOM rules. I'm just gonna refer to that. And then I'm adding rules on top of that. So you can sort of inherit supply chains. If that makes sense. The second thing you brought up is, um, the second thing that actually Winston brought up was how do I make sure that I know which signature signatures are being pushed all over the place, right? How do I know that these are the correct signatures? And it's sort of depending on just ACL, for example, because if the registry gets compromised, how do you know that the signature is legit? Uh, one way you do that is to use this concept of delegations where the registry can tell you, hey, look, I'm using my master key and I'm telling you that this is Vincent's key. And this is the key you should trust for this image, right? And no one else can. If they tried to tamper with the signature, you would know because it wouldn't match. Uh, and the third issue is that, that Nisha brought up was sometimes the S-bomb gets huge. And in fact, I have seen this in practice, <laughs> integrating Duffin and Dodo. So I know exactly what she's talking about. And the way we fixed this was to separate. You don't want to download it all at once necessarily. You may want to download it on demand. And the simplest way to do this is to just use different files, different pointers, for example, to different SPOM materials. Yeah, that uh, last bit is where I was thinking this kind of dovetails into the distribution spec and the image spec, which is that um, as, um, as uh, Steve has shown in his diagram over here, you, you want this, you want this data to exist in the background, but not necessarily when you're spinning up a container. Um, but when you're ready to go and distribute, at that point, you should be able to, I don't know, like query. Uh, I, I, I'm thinking about this from a client tool side, for example. So the client tool should be able to query the registry to see if this data exists and if it exists then what are all the what are the properties of it that it can use so um, like for example um, you know if there is if there is a signature and if it is a signature is it like what kind of signature is it am I capable of you know doing something with it yes no uh, that sort of thing um, so I don't know whether the distribution spec allows for that. I'm not sure about this. It, this, this sounds like part of what would flow into the kind of extensions we're talking about with like, if you have basic push and pull of objects, um, and tagging on them with something that we've 
has traditionally been an image name. Um, this this kind of workflow of like bolting all this other stuff on might be its own like particular extension. So that uh, it would because it would introduce new and different workflows and certainly new and different um, ACLs like permissions of who has the ability to attach. Um, so th this is this this very much would add into the kind of like extensions proposal that we're talking about of like. Above and beyond the basic current push and pull blob workflow, how, how does how does this how do you describe the workflow you're 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 saying in a way that works into a workflow of endpoints? Um, uh, and I don't have a good answer for that right now, but that's the kind of feedback feedback that I'm um, interested to hear before the distribution spec goes v one. Well, there are some sunny parts to this. So the actual like trust and permissions model and things for this in Toto does actually handle this with the way it deals with layouts and functionaries and other things of that sort. Um, however, the notion of how you collect and send and sign metadata uh, is done differently by all sorts of different adopters who have their own workflow models for this. So like Trishan can talk about what they do with their way of doing it. And, you know, we could get several other folks to talk about how, why they made, why, you know, different groups made different choices. Um, so that's an area where intentionally there's some flexibility left open because I think reasonable people may choose to collect and upload this information differently. I don't know if notary V2 needs to have like one prescribed thou shalt do it exactly this way sort of thing, or whether um, some exemplars are the right approach. Well, this is actually coming to a good transition point to hand off to the next topic was uh, the notary work that uh, Justin and Derek and I think uh, other Justin and others were involved as well. So if there's no other supply chain stuff or the supply chain focus conversations, I'll hand off to Justin for the next topic. So Justin, I guess that's all you. What did you just, sorry, for, for reference, what did you just cover now? Because I was not on the call at this. For, <laughs> uh, so I just, so I don't. How wonderful everything you're going to do and you're going to solve the world's uh, hunger problems. Or <laughs> just any, starting any sentence with that as a joke is not even funny anymore. So um, <laughs> anyway, we were just, I was trying to put some context of the SBOM, uh, some of the SBOM works and how we can just sign things. And there was, just some background on uh, some of the problem cases that were being solved. We're outlining here uh, have been accounted for some of the work that you guys have already been doing with Tuffin and Toto. So I think that kind of brings in the, the next conversation. Just you don't necessarily have to bridge on to this one per se, um, but just if you can just give an update on where you guys have been at for the last uh, week or so. Um, um, it, I, I the, probably the, the maybe the nearest bridge might be if. Um, Derek and Vincent want to talk about what they've been discussing around signatures in OCI directly, because that is obviously perhaps the most OCI relevant piece. Could maybe start with that? Because I know you have been talking about that. Uh, yeah, we covered it a little bit earlier. I don't, I don't know if Vincent wants to share what uh, we talked about earlier. Um, most of the discussion is just about how we're going to uh, design the endpoints, how they're going to fit into the existing OCI distribution spec, um, and how we're going to make it. Uh, basically, we're planning on having this extension design and try to get that into the 1.0 so that we can add uh, other things to the, the API without it having to explicitly be part of 1.0. Uh, so we can add, there's a few other things, but we want to tease out basically the whole API for how this flow is going to work for adding notary to or just signatures in general to the distribution spec. And once we kind of feel confident about that, then we can move forward with adding that to the 1.0 spec. Um, so I don't have the thing to show up that, that Vincent had up earlier that had the endpoints that we're talking about.
were you looking for Vincent to bring up the other doc? You want me to bring up something or? Yeah, if you can bring up that doc. Sorry, I'm, I'm not on my, I'm not at my laptop right now to share a screen. Um, and but this is the doc, your notes from uh, the last meeting? I think we have it in the notes. I don't know if we have it in the issue as well. Um, but essentially like what we have here is we have the extension route uh, where we can define what extensions are supported by a given registry. Uh, so this would be kind of global level what the registry is actually supporting. And then uh, we need some way to add the signatures to the individual uh, repositories. Uh, so just as blobs are repository specific, the same, uh, the same thing would be for signatures. So essentially when you go to do a push, you're pushing up all the blobs and then you could push up all the signatures that go along with it uh, using the same type of push flow. And then for pull, it would be the same thing. You push them up, then you can just pull down those signatures uh, for the individual blobs. Um, so, the so, so Derek, I'm sharing the notes. Is that what you want me to bring, share? Or is there some other data? Uh, or just if you have it, maybe you can take it. Um, oh, it's, I think it's this one here. Um, yeah, other than I can. Here, I'll, do you I want to share? It's, um, it's this, this one, I think. So, um, so the, the signatures extension, this dark here, Derek. Yeah, yeah, that's where we scribbled down some possibilities. Uh, so, I mean, we, we discussed kind of the, the different layouts earlier for, for how we could do it, whether it's kind of under a sandbox prefix uh, or something that's kind of overlaid with the existing distribution spec. Um, I think, I mean, the reason why we would overlay it over the existing distribution spec is the way ACLs are performed. So um, yeah. our thought here is that signatures from the perspective of how the registry stores blobs and how the registry handles permissions, signatures aren't really any different than blobs. They're just objects that are pushed up and pulled back down. Uh, so even permission wise, it, maybe it's the same, maybe there's permissions added. Um, that's up to the individual registries, um, but at least the way they handled uh, wouldn't be something that's, that's unique. Uh, two it's signatures. Using. That's great. Yeah, so I, well, we just wouldn't have, it's, it's really hard to say, like, uh, so you can imagine cases where there's abuse of just people pushing up bad signatures or just irrelevant signatures to blobs, and then you pull down, how do you know? Uh, now, you, now it's not just querying for an individual or querying what are the signatures for a blob, but then wanting to limit it by specific keys or something like that. Um, so you really want to have it be on a per repository basis anyways. Uh, so we could have the name at the front, just like all the other APIs, um, or if we had it sandboxed under kind of this underscore extension, uh, extension name, uh, you have kind of some duplication of, of how the API is def defined. Um, but either way, like we have to have the name in there in order to do those sort of permission checks and like, uh, putting each of the signatures into the bucket. But yeah, I mean, what other stuff do you want to talk about for like from how it relates to like OCI? I mean, that, that's kind of our thought of just making it ensure that it flows into the existing like OCI flows, uh, at least in the way like push pull, uh, the way it fits into our like content, uh, the content hashing uh, per repository and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, I, mean, we, go on I don't think we we came up with a, I don't think we've, we got to the point where we figured out how individual signatures are referenced in the API. Um, that's something we need to figure out. Like, is it, is each signature gonna have its own identifier kind of almost like tagging? Is each signature gonna have its own hash? Like how do you delete individual signatures? Uh, I think that, that was one thing we wanted or uh, permission wise, whether it's a different permission for deleting signatures versus adding signatures. Uh, and stuff like that. 
or could you add signatures but not push content? You know, stuff stuff like that. Well, that part would be nice, right? Because we've had these scenarios where to to sign something. You have this problem with the notary v1 stuff where or Docker content trust. I don't know which way to call it, but where I could have if I ask for something with Docker content Docker content trust turned on, I could actually get completely different content using the same exact tag. So well, that's that's a slightly different issue um, in the sense that notary v1 has a separate this would avoid that because it would be cool. attached to the same content, but this does come up to some of the issues that we started discussing at our meeting on Friday about um, the fact that there's no, there's some differences with TAF in that there's no natural way in OCI to sign a collection of objects because um, there isn't really um, you know, it's not, it's, it's no, it's a REST API in effect, there's no concept of a collection of objects in a registry and it's a distributed system and there might not be a consistent set of objects at any time. So any kind of collection based signatures are problematic. So signing individual objects makes sense. There's also the question about whether which has come up about whether signing in what in what way signing names is meaningful in the sense of or the, or the equivalent of signing git tags if you look at it as a git repo um but yeah signing collections is definitely problematic but this this and but that's partly where the, the these semantic differences that, that we had as a bit of discussion about them on friday about um semantic differences between a package, a traditional package repo and a registry and the kind of issues that um, potentially mean that the model um, potentially differs from um, from the TAF model just because of those differences. So, uh, sorry for the maybe dumb question, but what, why would I query a signature and just a signature? A single signature. Yes, like what? I get, uh, I do V2, X6, and, uh, and I get a 128 bytes. Are you talking uh, what, about what's what up on that, the screen right now? Uh, yeah, or, or in general, like why would we need a specific endpoint for signatures rather than their... Uh, the, this this part of this discussion right here, and this is obviously not comprehen comprehensive for like signatures. This is just trying to talk, think through one workflow. As far as it relates to uh, registries, this would be... Um, show me the the list of signatures that have attested this blob. And since you're pushing a blob, it's not particularly descriptive whether or not that's a, say, tar layer, or if that's a manifest or a manifest list. Um, it's just, you've, you've signed a thing, and so to get as close to what Justin was just saying, it's like, I signed the digest of the manifest list that I just pushed and that manifest list might have, you know, arm and, you know, AMD 64 and each of them have a, a nested list of objects. And it's kind of a Merkle tree that you just signed the, the digest of that top level manifest list. And so one of these endpoints right here, you're not querying the, the signature per se is just to say, show me, all the signatures that have been attached to that top level digest. Because it might be that um, just the build infrastructure itself, you know, whatever build thing built it and pushed it, signed it, and then later they came through and they also signed it with their production key that like, this, this has been run through some CI system. You might end up having more than one signature attached to it. Um, this is just to get a list back. So you know, is it, it's not querying per se, per se a signature. It's just a way of discovering the signatures that are attached to some other digest that exists in the registry. 
Okay. Yeah, I, I just wanted to make sure of that. Uh, would we like signatures for law? Yeah, because fetching the signature itself should be reusing the existing registry APIs for like, okay, so here's, you just gave me the digest of a signature for another object. Now I'm, now I have the, you know, digest of the signature that I need to go fetch from the content addressable store. So well, part of the reason why I asked this, and it's probably been uh, considered, but uh, we would have to not trust that the server is giving us a bunch of signatures. We would have to verify them ourselves anyway. Uh, and this type of matching is probably also a vector of the uh, problems. Sorry, could you repeat that? I, I missed a little bit of it. Well, so uh, we're, we're having detached signatures live somewhere on a database. And uh, they are attesting for another blob that lives somewhere else in the database. Uh, and we are somewhat trusting the server to serve us the signatures uh, for this blob. But the server, if it's, uh, and it has happened before, the server can be hacked and it can be forced to do the, like not the right thing then uh, it can either serve as uh, signatures that are not uh, relevant to this blob, or it can serve as a subset of the signatures that are relevant to this blob for any sort of nefarious reason. Uh, and that's because we're giving the server the power to say this is, uh, these are the signatures for this blob. So you still have to fetch the, if you got the list of, list, if you said who all has signed this blob, and you get back a list of descriptors of other objects you'd have to, you know, signatures that you have to go fetch. You'd still have to fetch them to validate that you trust the issuer and or the content that they signed, which would be presumably the checksum of that original object you queried for. Right. So say that I say that to the, the U.S. government and the Iranian government both signed a blob, uh, and I query for it, and I only trust the. I only trust it when both of them agree on it. A server can still serve me a perfectly nice and dandy signature over only one of the only one of the two signatures. And that is a trust assumption that I'm giving to the server now to give me a correct uh, series of signatures uh, over this blob. So I can only get the signature from the Iranian government or the US government, depending on how the uh, this server wants to uh, misrepresent the facts. I, but, but it, it, yeah, I do. But is there any alternative to that? Because you can all well, that's, you never. That's what the snapshotting role does in top. And that's why I think uh, we should all just not throw it away because we think that registers are, registers are different from package repositories. That's fair. I don't. I, um, I, I would imagine if you need to attest that, that you would download that blob and somehow, you know, if effectively carry it detached or cache it detached locally so that you could have the blobs and these two disparate signatures that prove the story that you're saying that you've checked later, but the registry is effectively done for that. Well, the registry can selectively serve you with content to trick you into thinking that somebody didn't sign for something when they signed for something. Right. It's, it's hard to prove the, that a repository is omitting data that it should be providing you. That's the real challenge. And effectively what the snapshot role does is it makes the repository attest to what metadata it has to users. And then it's not possible to go back and say, you know, oh, I actually didn't have this because beforehand when the repository was you know, honest and doing things that had already told you that it had this version. So maybe I'm missing something, but are you saying, are you proposing a particular logic piece here that this is missing that you know of, or are you just saying that this is? Uh, yes, I, I just wanted to make sure that uh, the, I mean, to me, this is a common uh, 
a common pitfall when designing these types of endpoints. And uh, again, I know that we're right in the time of like considering these things. That's why I bring it up. And I think uh, having a snapshot capability can prevent things like this from happening. Is the is is the question whether we all clients should always do snapshotting, or it's a a thing that is a capability when I want to do an extra verification of trust? All clients that don't want to be hacked should use it, which should be all clients. Who would sign the, the snapshot? The repository registry, whatever you want to call it, is the usual party that does it. Mirrors and others like that typically do not. Well, so so, is, this, is this solving for the, the mirror case or the, un, like, I don't trust the registry server that I'm talking to case? It's, it's more the second case um, because you, you may say, well, maybe they were good in the past, but you know, you want, you, what you ideally want is you don't want them to be able to go and tell you, hey, the latest version of this important piece of software is this old version of this thing that is 18 security patches behind or something. You want them once, once people have sort of said like, yeah, you know, this is, um, you know, I'm attesting that, that this is the thing that you should use. You shouldn't be able to like remove their signatures and remove their trust in things, which is what snapshot prevent. I think that the case I'm trying to understand is, as I think Derek just said, this is there's the tr untrusted source and uh, registry.com. I won't pick on any particular one here. Um, that is a place where people get content from it. But then I bring that and I bring that content into my environment because we all use upstream content. And I do this enhanced checks that we're talking about. Uh, later on, when I'm in my production environment, which is, you know, we're still checking things, but we don't necessarily check them as detailed. Uh, there's bound, the, the levels of verification that are done at a certain point uh, because it just becomes suboptimal at a point. And I think that's part of this verification. So I, I'm trying to make sure we can achieve both without having to do the deep verification checks every time. The deep verification is very little, like as you call it that, it's very little additional work, especially in your context of having a server that's serving like some subset of content. It's actually harder to do it across a large amount of content than a small amount. So, I mean, it, it's, it's an extra, you know, couple signature verifications that, that even like in the automotive case where um, people are using this on little embedded devices. The, they're doing these checks and these verifications. So I'm, I don't, it's, this isn't like a, um, you know, you don't have to mine a, like a, a winning block in Bitcoin or something like that to verify um, this happening. It's, it's not, um, it's certainly not onerous, especially if you're redistributing a subset. So I guess what I'm trying to figure out here is, um, so Notary V1, it kind of turned the uh, the key ownership model back to the publisher, right? And the problem with getting rid of that is the, the registry itself isn't necessarily trusted. Um, so is the question here, how do you get those same guarantees, for example, being able to push up as the publisher specific types of signatures that would be snapshots um, that would represent kind of all of the all of the uh, all the signatures that could be expected for that blob um, like trying to get all the same tough guarantees that's, that's, that's what I'm trying to figure out here I'm not as involved in the notary v2 on, on that side of it but that is something I, I'm curious about as well So I think this is the conversation that we kind of have in the threat modeling. I, I'm sorry, I'm just looking at time, people dropping off. So um, this is the exact conversation we want to have in the threat modeling and then the key management uh, aspects, um, to some extent, the experience as well. So uh, this is the ones where I guess I'm looking at you, Justin Cormack. Yeah, I think also there's a, there's a, there's a bunch of questions around what, um, 
um, I mean, I think that we could um, snapshot signatures for a particular um, piece of content, but piece for across multiple pieces of content is more problematic. So we could have a signed, um, I think it'd be very straightforward to have a signed um, version of the um, keys, sorry, of the signatures for a particular piece of content, um, because that would just be another um, another signature on top of this. We'd have to work out the API thing. I still think that the um, a snapshot's role across multiple pieces of content is more difficult to implement. Um, but we should um, we should have that conversation um, because yeah I think because there's as yeah we started discussing this issue about what's what's actually feasible to do in a registry architecture in a way that's integrated versus what we actually need in the threat model. We've got there's a bunch of outstanding issues from our meeting on Friday in terms of just writing down some of the um, scenarios which I'm going to work on, but I think these conversations are very useful from that point of view in terms of um, putting together what we need in the registry versus what we what we need from the threat model point of view and how they relate to each other. So I think continuing to do that makes sense. Well, I think you've got all the right people in your working group to continue these. It's just a matter of us finding time to spend more detail on this. So um, uh, you, you'll probably start seeing Ian uh, join some of these also. I just call him out at the, at least the bottom of my list here in this list of people from, he's in, uh, in, in our Azure group that's also interested in a lot of this work. So just trying to ramp him up to speed on the continue, container aspects of it. And uh, just looking forward to more of these conversations. So first I'll just say, thank you for everybody for joining um, with being flexible. Um, and I encourage everybody to continue to engage in the working groups. Um, one of the things that I noticed is that we need to figure out how to have better note takers for people that aren't speaking uh, or for to balance the person that's speaking and whatever. Um, but we have the recording and I just wanted to thanks to everyone and we'll continue to keep the notes going and keep the work going. Ciao. Thanks. See you guys. We'll see you all next week. Bye. Thank you.